Trying to be as clear as possible and then having somebody else read your initial drafts and give you that feedback is also a very good way to tell if you're explaining something clearly, um, especially if that someone is not regularly in the industry that you work with. No matter what you're doing and uh, no matter how far you are in your career, there's always a point to be made about thinking through a different perspective, whether that's a beginner's mindset or someone that's not in the same industry. That kind of goes hand in hand with being empathetic with your colleagues and community and audience, but especially for those who are creating content or content including API documentation, Putting yourself in those people's footsteps and seeing it through their eyes, I think overall makes anything that we produce much, much better and much more valuable. My guest today is Adrienne Abraganza Take, uh, whom I have met in API Days this June when she was presenting about 12 facets of hope in API, but you have a very, very long history in the API economy and documentation and software advocacy. So I think we have a lot of stories to tell. So very, very warm welcome, Maria. Thank you for joining uh, me here. Thanks, Laura. Thank you for having me. I'm really happy to be here. We wanted to talk about uh, the juicier part of your presentation, but something very important happened in the meantime, namely uh, that uh, your second book uh, on code review uh, was published, um, I think two months ago, right? Uh, well, yeah, I do want to um, be like full disclaimer, it is out on early release, so I am still working on it. Uh, but yes, it is available as of this recording. Uh, the first four chapters are out. Um, and it is my second full public or about to be published book. The first book was a, a book teaching kids how to program in Python. Um, but yeah, I'm very, very excited about this code review book and um, all the learnings I've I've put into it. <laughs> So you refer to it as the code review book, but uh, is it my bad? Uh, wasn't the title looks good to me? You're right. Yes, I'm actually very happy with that title. Um, I fought really hard for it. Um, when we were in the middle of discussing what this book would be called, I said, oh, I have the perfect name and I'm going to do whatever it takes to get that name because it uh, looks good to me. Um, if you've ever worked in software development or have done a code review, that's kind of has this connotation. Uh, you write LGTM when you're finished reviewing somebody's code changes. Sometimes it's a good thing. You know, it's a short code review, everything looks great. And you're saying thumbs up looks good to me. It's ready to be merged in and deployed and move along the pipeline. Other times, most people kind of hear that and go, oh, you didn't even read it. Or I have way more changes in there and you only took five minutes. You didn't really do a proper review. So it's kind of a play on that notion that I would say a lot of people who have done uh, code reviews know that they say looks good to me. They automatically think code reviews. That's at least the context with which they know that phrase. And so uh, that's what it ended up being. The title looks uh, looks good to me, constructive code reviews. <laughs> so let me ask you about your, your, your professional career. And I'm particularly interested always. So if you want, we can start from very, very far because uh, a lot of our guests had surprisingly, incredibly <laughs> meandering pathways uh, up to the point of being involved with API documentation. Where, where do you... Maybe you get onto this path. Oh, I love talking about it because it is uh, not a linear path, let's just say. Um, so and when I started, I had no inklings to be in the tech industry. Um, in fact, when I was younger, really the only foray into tech was maybe having a Nintendo GameCube. So you know, people can figure out the math there of <laughs> when I was born, I guess. That was my first gaming console. And then I obviously had a an older CRT monitor and played games there like Roller Coaster Tycoon, Age of Empires, my favorite game of all time. Uh, but th really, that was my only tech adjacent uh, context that I've had. I didn't really have any... Um, you know, model figures or role models that kind of pushed me into this realm. 
So fast forward to college where I needed to uh, find a, a job to help pay for school. I looked all around. I needed to find a job that was on campus because I was living on campus at the time. And I just needed to find something to help pay the bills. So after scouring all of the student jobs, the only one that was really that paid the most was a job at a help desk uh, in the Office of Information Technology uh, at UNLV. Um, I'm here based in Las Vegas. So that was my first job. That was my first real, like, I would say professional foray into tech. And there I was the one that you called to reset your passwords. I was the one that tried to troubleshoot what was going on with your computer, why you couldn't access something. So that was really where I started to see that it was problem solving. It was listening to people explain uh, poorly or not poorly what was going on and then trying to deduce what it is, what the root cause was of whatever they were calling about and try to help them. So that went on for most of college. Um, in the middle of that, probably around my third year of college, I got into a software development internship uh, and that's where it all changed. Mm. I was still not thinking... I was still not majoring in um, what I at what I majored ended up majoring in, which is management information systems. Uh, so not a computer science degree. I like to point that out um, mm -hmm. to people who ask me. Um, and this was where I, the first and only time I got to work with a full team of women uh, of software developers, and that was really really cool. Um, but. Uh, as I worked there and worked on some of the projects um, that supported the university, that's where I started to learn, okay, you know, I would talk to database administrators and this is how you interact and work with and integrate with data. And then I would uh, work with system administrators. This is how you deal with some networking issues and roles and all those things. So all of that together, I'm like, you know what, this is actually kind of a fun thing to do. <laughs> and so I quickly switched my major. My major was actually pre-international business, which was not what I thought it was. Um, mm -hmm. I thought that if I had an international business major, that I would get to travel around the world and just kind of, I don't know, do something just to travel, but that was not it. So I changed it to management information systems. And that's how I entered software. To travel around the world. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Unbeknownst to me, I would actually get to do that with this role, which is really cool, but it wasn't the initial intent. Um, so after UNLV, uh, I pretty much learned as much as I could in that role. I started to feel like I needed to learn more uh, and started to get into web development. Um, but I felt like I wasn't growing in my current role. So I actually took a really scary leap and left the university system, which is very comfortable, very safe. Uh, I knew a lot of things. I knew how things worked. And I'm like, well, I need to really get out there. So I ended up moving to a healthcare company as a junior .NET developer. And that was my first real, I would say, corporate job. You know, you had to go into the office, you had to work with other people, you had dress codes, all that stuff. Um, I, I worked there for a bit. I worked for an e-commerce site. I worked for a financial company. Um, and it was at that financial company where um, I was learning a lot about, in, the, in that case, their platform was transitioning to Azure. So we were moving to the cloud like a lot of companies were. Um, and in that time, I wanted to, you know, share what I was learning. Uh, and I did that through Instagram. Now, I was very late. I feel like I was very late to the game with Instagram. It had been out for a while. <laughs> you were um, sharing Instagram on, on Instagram, how you were migrating to Azure? What? Yeah, yeah, I it it just happened that um you know Instagram was a thing at the time and I said what is this Instagram thing? So I decided to start an account. And as I started to see what Instagram was about, I did actually find some like tech related accounts where they were sharing, you know, what they were learning or what they do as a software developer. But of course, I didn't see many people that look like me. And so I said, well, maybe this is what I will do as part of my account. So that's what I started to do as I started to learn, you know, different parts of how we were migrating to the cloud. I would share those tidbits on Instagram and just share, you know, my life and shared uh, 
what it meant to be a software developer as me, as a Filipino American who likes to dress up, you know, is really trying to say not all software developers are like our men or are dressed casually or are hacker people or whatever the stereotype was. I just wanted to put my story out there and say, hey, uh, well, there are people like me that exist and hopefully other people can find me. That was the very first start of, I would say, this kind of sharing and uh, trying to form a community, trying to engage others, trying to share my story and help others. And again, without intent to grow, like, you know, a lot of people now are like, I want to be a tech influencer. That was not the goal. I just kept on sharing and more people started coming. And it was through those, uh, you know, opportunity uh, opportunities came to me because I started to share uh, all of these learnings uh, through Instagram. That's how I got my opportunity with my first book. Some a publisher approached me to write the book to teach kids how to program in Python. That's how I actually got the uh, job. Uh, to switch it over into developer advocacy at MongoDB, which is where I was before I'm, I was here now at Cisco. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was very, very exciting. It was a very large switch because I'm not just fully coding anymore or participating in helping build a platform. I was now trying to teach others how to do what I was doing. And so that all happened. Um, I went into conference speaking again by accident. Um, that started because uh, I went to a tech conference. Somebody was talking about something that I really wanted to learn about, and they were doing a very, very poor job. They were just kind of reading off bullet points uh, whenever there were opportunities to explain something visually. They were not there. They just kind of spoke. So it was very difficult to follow what they were trying to teach. And so I said, well, what does it take to actually get up onto that stage? Because I feel like I could do a much better job than this person. So I researched it, found out about the whole call for papers process, how you write an abstract and, you know, organizers typically choose from all of these people that submit. I did that. I got accepted to, I think it was seven conferences the very first time. Oh. And so I was overwhelmed. I was like, okay, the advice told me to apply to as many as possible if you're just starting out, but I was not expecting this. So uh, yeah, so that was kind of how I fell into really enjoying conference speaking as a way to teach uh, because I just really like the format. I really like putting some uh, thought into my slides when I can. I like using visual aids. I like using analogies. I like making it fun. And that just really lends itself well to the way that I like to teach. And so doing that a lot, um, I ended up here at Cisco and at MongoDB, but uh, now here at Cisco where I'm hopefully trying to teach uh, developers different topics depending on what is needed. And so that was the long story to how I got to where I am today. <laughs> And that was then a positive accident that I uh, met you talking about documentation and advocating for high quality documentation, or you do spend most of your time advocating for documentation. So the thing with me is that I, you know, I know a little bit about a lot of things. And what I tend to focus on are these topics that I consider everybody should know as a foundation when working in the tech industry or specifically in software development. That's why I'm writing a book on code reviews. It's a, such an integral part, but there's no good information on it from start to finish or what it means to have a good process. Everyone knows mm -hmm. you have to do it, but well, what does it good look like? like? What is yeah. good? Exactly. Yeah. So the same thing with documentation. As I started to write more tutorials uh, on how to do something, as I started to give talks on how to do something or do technical demos, I would find there are differences between what actually has a learner understand what it is that you're trying to teach and what doesn't. And it's the same for me as a consumer. When I go to learn something new, if your documentation is terrible and I can't figure it out within the first minute or two, I'm leaving. I'm probably never going to use that product again. And so these learnings, I really wanted to push out into the community because there were so many pieces of documentation out there that could be improved. And there's a lot of developer experiences that could be improved 
through a documentation. This is the first spot that a lot of people, a lot of developers uh, kind of get introduced to your product or your project. So you really need to have a really good first impression in those things in order for not only the developer experience to be great, but for your product to actually get out there and, and grow. So yes, it is kind of an accident. I don't talk about documentation all the time, but it is certainly something that is important enough to me where I took the time to create some content on it, uh, namely that talk. And of course, anyone that asks me, I'm like, here's how you write better documentation or here's how you make it clear and concise and have people actually learn or understand what it is that you're trying to convey. So you have the fortunate position of having a little bit of an outsider view also on the world of documentation, on the work of documentation, which means that it's easier to spot the nonsensical practices, let's put it that way, um, or self-serving practices or the missing ones. And one of the things that I, probably it's easy to remember, I have learned from Chris McDermott uh, when I was asking about, okay, practices, practices, but how do you get a better practice? And he said an, an elemental condition to do better what you do is to see how really good looks like. That was very memorable learning. And this is a little bit also how I guess you wrote your book when you were saying, okay, code reviews, we do understand the word, we probably have met this practice, but from beginning to end, an overarching view and some examples, maybe not yet. What inspired you to write the book? I mean, to get knowledgeable and to talk about it is one thing, but to get to the other side of the hill where you can say, I wrote the book, that takes a bit more momentum. What gave you that momentum? That's a great question. Uh, a lot of the, my own experiences and my own bad and good experiences in code reviews at all of the companies that I've worked at really led me to want to write this book because there are so many people that I've spoken to when we just get onto the topic of code reviews. They're like, ah, I really, really do not like it. I despise it. Some people say it's a waste of time, which I don't agree with. Some people say, well, it's uh, if you're doing other things like, say, pair programming or mob programming, it's obsolete. You don't need it. And then now, especially now, you know, as of this time where AI is the hot new thing, it's like, well, let's just automate it all away. Let's just let the robots take care of the whole code review process itself. So all of these things um, I have an opinion on, but I also, again, it's coming from a, if we can make code reviews better for all developers everywhere, then I would love to be a part of that. And so a lot of things are what I would consider common sense. But unfortunately, that's just not spread around, I guess. Or if you do code reviews, you kind of get stuck with the very first time that you do them. And then you just assume you carry that forward with you. Whatever your first experience was, you just think that's how it has to be the rest of the time. So all of that together, I was like, you know what, I, I need to change this. When you say this to people that you carry forward the, the, the first experience with code review, do people react like, oh, I thought that was just me? Yes, yes. And or they go, yes, exactly. Because the way that they learn it the first time is like their brain is wired to say no matter where they go I mean obviously unless they go to another team where they have a pretty good onboarding process that shows them how their code review is done they kind of just take what they've learned about code reviews in their very first professional job and apply that copy and paste to the next team to the next job to the next company and so yes they go oh i thought that's just me or oh yes resoundingly yes but the the story that i always remember and a applies to this first time was I had a really bad experience the first time I had a code review. Um, this was at my job at the healthcare company where I was still fairly new. Like I said, my role was junior.net developer and I was kind of switching uh, stacks per se. Uh, I was just getting into the .NET ecosystem. There's very specific ways on how to work within that framework. And um, I was in my first code review with some of the seniors and they were just very mean in the code review. Like, why would you implement it in this way? Or did you even read the documentation? And 
you know, I would comment back there, yes, I did read the documentation, but this is what I understood of it. And this is how it came out. You know, there was a lot of opportunity to be kinder, to kind of understand, hey, I'm not a senior like you. I don't understand the context of how this application works uh, as well as you do or the nuances or things like that. And then me putting up my first pull request and having hopefully my first change is integrated to have that experience of, oh my gosh, like I feel like an idiot. Maybe I'm not supposed to be here. I'm ruining it for the team. All of those terrible feelings. Like that's how I always felt about code reviews. When we moved into my next job where I had a much better team, uh, this was in the financial uh, um, company that I worked at. Um, it was completely different. And I said, why aren't all code reviews like this? Uh, the team was much more forgiving. They actually had a documented process of how code reviews are supposed to be done. And it was actually flexible. So as the team grew, as our project grew, we were allowed, we were enabled to say, hey, this part is not really working anymore. Let's actually change it. Or, hey, we're finding a bottleneck at this particular point in our code review. Let's see what we can do to fix that. Can we automate some parts there that make sense? Or is there just something else that we need to do to speed this up? So all of those learnings, I was like, you know, if other people are going through what I went through the very first time, I want them to know that there's a better way. So for anyone that is just starting out with code reviews and thinking this is how it has to be, I want to change that impression. And then especially for anyone who's a tech lead or an engineering manager or anyone who has either that authority or influence to kind of shape the processes for their team, I would love for them to read this and say, hey, this is how you can help you. This is how you can advocate for your team and make it better and make this process really, really good for your team. And you said that the first four chapters are finalized for now. What's the feedback? Did people take your advice to a test drive? Yes, that was nerve wracking and enlightening. Um, so because it is still in progress, the first really big review was done uh, prior to it being released to the public. So um that was eye-opening. There's this program where they can view my book uh, digitally and they can add comments everywhere. And if you can imagine, there was comments everywhere. <laughs> so I got a little bit worried, but I read through them all and they were mostly all really good feedback, either uh, agreements with what I was saying, some people actually added their own anecdotes like, oh, here's another example that might fit into your chapter, or here's how my team did it. And I love that feedback because I only know my experiences and the other developers that I've spoken to, and I kind of aggregate that into this book. So I openly ask for that, including now the first four chapters, if you do get onto it, there's a full forum on there. So if you are reading and you see something, uh, I get comments every day um, for feedback, which is the whole point of the early release. Overall, it's been very, very good feedback. And I'm looking forward to receiving the rest of the feedback as the rest of the chapters get published. And during this process of, well, the whole engagement with code reviews, did your relationship to code reviews and your understanding of code reviews change color? I would say yes, um, because I would spend a lot of time looking through uh, research papers that actually focused on different parts of code reviews. So for example, a little sneak peek, um, the work that I'm doing or the chapter I was just finishing up, which is how to write a really good um, code review comments. Uh, that's a big part of why people dread it. Like, they're like, oh, no, if I get a lot of comments, that means I did something wrong or people don't know how to leave constructive feedback or people are very harsh and mean and say, oh, this is terrible. <laughs> you know, like the comments that I received in my first code review. So through reading some research papers, I found that uh, there was a study done where they said, if you focus on the developer in your code review comments, you are they classified those comments as more toxic than comments that just focused on the actual code or any technical discussions. So if you say something like, you know, you implemented this uh, incorrectly, or if you start the comment with the word you, 
and you focus on what the developer did, it is more likely to be a, a conflict in the pull request discussion than if you just focus on, you know, files or this method or um, this implementation, uh, anything that was not focused on the developer on the code was usually labeled or classified as non-toxic. And it also had a higher chance of actually being approved and not having a conflict in the discussion. So that was a really interesting finding that I found, which supported what I kind of, you know, felt and knew inside all the time. It's like, you know, don't personally attack developers don't personally attack your colleagues or don't write comments in a non-empathetic way, uh, write them to focus on the code at hand. And that way you just eliminate all of these subjective things or potentially hurtful things that can happen in the code review. So that's, uh, that's one part uh, of this chapter that I was just working on. <laughs> mm -hmm. What do you see as the most surprisingly overlapping aspects of code reviews and writing documentation. I'm thinking about the mental twists uh, yeah. the image of what you painted about being in a help desk came to mind, but okay, let's forget that without influencing you. So when I hear that question, um, the first thing that immediately comes to mind is there's a lack of writing your pull request or change request, merge request, whichever tool you use, wherever you propose your changes for someone else to review, much like documentation, if it's not filled with context and filled with descriptions and filled so that the person reading it understands your code changes, it's almost not worth it. And that's really why a lot of pull requests or code reviews, number one, take so long, which is a very big complaint of why people don't like to do it. And number two, it leads to so much discussion because the person reviewing it takes so long to either find that information themselves or um, just does not understand what is happening. And so they have to interface with the author of the code changes a lot more. So this intersection of how you want documentation to be concise, to be clear, to get, to put the why of what it is that you're changing in there you want to paint this picture, this story, this self-sustaining, isolated piece of documentation, and that no matter who reads it or whoever gets a chance to look through it, they understand what it is that you're trying to convey. So it's the same when you're writing documentation that's showing how to use an API. If you have no examples, if you have no you know, interactivity on how the responses are going to be formed, if you don't share what the types are expected, if you are not clear with an example of how to properly integrate it into your application, all of these things that are key to making the documentation useful <laughs> is the same in when you write uh, your pull request description. So if you're having a change, you know, a lot of people just leave an empty description. Go look at my pull requests. When you look at the code, it should be self-explanatory. You know, sure, I'm sure there are people who write really great code that's like that, but it's also your responsibility as someone asking someone to review their code to put the context in there. The code is the what, the description and all of the uh, ancillary information is the why, and that's very, very important. So those two together, I think, really match what I think we're trying to do with documentation as well. You add value by having more information describe what it is that you're trying to get merged in. And it's also something that a lot of people tend to neglect, like documentation, unfortunately. Without that, you are left with Again, longer delays, more discussion. And then the other part too that a lot of people forget is if you don't take the time to write really good pull request descriptions or at least explain the context or the why, much later on, you actually deprive yourself of really valuable information later on. Let's say you are a few versions down and there's a bug that came up or you're trying to understand why something was implemented the way that it was. You could have captured that in the in the pull request description, explaining how you got to this point and why you're making this change. So that acts as a really valuable source of archived information for your team to understand how the code base got to the way that it 
got to, you know. So again, if you neglect to write that, just like you neglect to write documentation, there's a lot of value that is missing. And that's very, that could be very detrimental to the team. So if I turn that around, that <laughs> means that if someone is trying to, I don't like the expression motivate someone, but let's say someone is trying to motivate most of the time coding person to document that code as a narrate that code, then the need for the narrative could be brought through the empathy with their own experience of what does it feel like to get the code review request without the explanation of what you're reviewing here? Yes, ideally, you know, having gone through that process myself of reviewing pull requests or reviewing code where I'm like, okay, what, what is the motivation here? Is there a ticket that's attached as to why this change is being proposed? Is this fixing a bug that's been documented? Why are you implementing it in, in this particular way? Especially if there are changes that are larger or are adding a new method, like you need that context. And for me to do my job properly, to give it a proper review, I, I can't do that unless I understand what is happening. There's a difference between you don't understand the code uh, and you're, you know, I don't want to say wasting the time, but there's a level expectation that, you know, you understand the code that is is being uh, written but or understand the programming language fundamentals. You're not asking those types of questions. It's more along the lines of why did you create this new method or how come you're fixing it in this way? Or is this actually optimizing for something that we planned on, or are you just prematurely fixing something that doesn't need to be fixed? So all of those um, pieces of information, again, should be in the pull request description or in the description of wherever it is you're doing your code review. Um, and and I try to show that in the book. It's it's due diligence on both parts. Just like we ask people to review our code and we don't want them to take two minutes to look at it and say, cool, looks good to me, when you know there's no way they really thoroughly reviewed it. It's there's some due diligence on the part of the author to say, well, if you if you want a proper review, if you want a diligent review, you got to put in a little bit of effort to explain what is happening here and put in as much context as, as possible for me to understand it as a reviewer. So, yeah, hopefully honing in <laughs> on those uh, experiences that people may have had. It's kind of like open a pull request that you would love to receive <laughs> is kind of the mantra there. And while this writing is happening, also AI is happening, are you changing some aspects or changing some advice or adding like, okay, and this is the alternative as of 2023 August? So there's a lot of stuff coming out there. I think the best way that I can address that. So I still think AI is there to help, not replace. So a really good example is... You know, a lot of people say, I, I despise code reviews. If I can find a tool that just does it for me, great. But if you see with almost all tools that use AI, they always say, well, you can use it to kind of get you started, but you still need a human to review it. You can't fully rely on it, at, at least at this point in time, to say everything is great. Every every tool always says, please make sure to review this. Same with some code review tools. There are some code review tools I see uh, that has AI backing it. And so what they'll do is they will help estimate, okay, how long will this code review take? Five minutes, 10 minutes? And in those ways, I think AI would be invaluable because then you can help the reviewer kind of prioritize, okay, these pull requests or these um, PRs are going to take five minutes. I have five minutes. Let me get through these right now versus some that are longer. I need more focus time for this. Let me do that. There are some tools that are trying to analyze um, what it is the code review is about and kind of give a summary of what the changes are. So again, helping but not replacing. Yes, go ahead, use those to start the description of what it is, but I'm willing to bet that those descriptions are just, they're like code review comments that explain what is actually happening and they're not useful. They're just a summary of it. So like I said before, the code is the what, the description should be the why, Sometimes tools don't have that yet. They don't understand nuance. They don't understand context. They don't understand previous decisions or 
possible knowledge that is only among the team. They just see what is in front of them, statically analyze the code, and then spit back out what it is they understand. So again, helping but not replacing. You can use it to start, but you still need to review it. Uh, and then lastly, there are tools that um, I think, uh, I don't know if it's actually out in public, but I did see a tool in a research paper where they tried to assess the sentiment in code review comments and say, okay, this is like leaning towards not nice, toxic kind of comments. And this is leaning towards more objective comments focused on the code, not the developer. And so maybe if there was a tool like that, similar to Grammarly, that kind of checks your spelling and grammar, but instead checks your tone of voice. <laughs> I, I know that's going to be very divisive, but uh if there was something like that that says, hey, you shouldn't probably write this comment or, you know, you need to refocus and focus on the code rather than the developer. I feel like that might be useful, um, especially for people who don't write constantly or maybe English is not a first language or if you're writing in another language and you don't know the nuances of that language. It's more, again, to help you do a better job. So... With that said, I do not think AI should replace code reviews at all. Like <laughs> you can use them to help uh, the process in many different ways, but in the end, it still takes a human eye to review what is in front of you and to ultimately make the final judgment. Uh, and I'm going to stick to that until I see AI improves. <laughs> <laughs> and everything that you advocate for in any kind of writing or instruction giving is the mindset of a beginner to be aware that you have to get yourself into the mindset of a beginner. This is sometimes easier said than done and sometimes easier overdone than necessary. In your experience, what kind of mantras would you give to people where if they are unsure whether they have tuned into the right frequency there, how can they get there? How can they find their beginner's mindset in that context that is enough? So one of the things that I really advocate for is really trying to understand who your audience is. That's probably the most crucial piece of information you can have before you start to write anything or create anything so that you can have that basis. So if you know you're going to be talking to students who are just graduating from a computer science degree, you know you can have a level... Um, expectation uh, or a foundational knowledge that you can expect from the people you're about to write to. If you're writing to a bunch of senior engineers who have been in the industry for 10 years, you don't have to go as in depth about uh, some basics, right? You can go straight into the really juicy deep dive stuff that they're probably yearning for. So, you know, number one, try to find out who your audience is. If you don't have access to that, or you're kind of just, you know, uh, starting out maybe writing a blog and you don't know yet who your uh, audience is going to be, I would say there's a happy medium uh, that aligns with just having clear writing. So especially in the tech industry, there's a lot of acronyms, for example, spell those out the first time or link to something, a definition, and then continue to use the acronyms later on. If there, there was one idea that I was actually toying with, I still haven't gotten around to it, which is to address this issue, you, you know, it's probably not scalable, but you would write two versions. You would write a beginner version where it's very beginner friendly, everything's spelled out, a lot of things are, you know, uh, explained very clearly the first time. And then you have a, an advanced version and you would toggle between what you felt you were as a reader. So obviously that would take a lot of time on the creator's part, right? You'd have to write two versions, but um, I've seen some very few people actually do that. That way they know um, once they are able to get, capture that information about their audience, oh, okay, I can go with the beginner version or I could go with the advanced version and give people more juicy tidbits. Um, but I think just tr trying to be as clear as possible and then having somebody else 
read your initial drafts and give you that feedback is also a very good way to tell if you're explaining something clearly, um, especially if that someone is not regularly in the industry that you work with. So if you are able to clearly explain something to someone that's not in the industry, I think you're going in the right direction and you're able to at least keep them engaged and also teach them what it is that you're trying to teach. But um, yeah, that all falls back to the whole, I say the beginner's mindset, uh, namely, if you just assume that the people that you are writing for or creating content for have no knowledge on the subject that puts you in a better writing mindset to say, oh, if this person doesn't know, I should probably add a sentence or two to just fill in that gap. Or I should probably, you know, link to some other pieces of information in case they want to continue reading about this. Uh, having that mindset that you're you're writing for someone who may not know anything about the topic just makes you, I think, a better writer because you're considering all of those pieces and you're trying to add more value to what it is that you're you're writing or creating. You give a relatively lot of presentations in your work. Do you see a shift in the expectation? What you were just talking about, the uh, empathy with the beginner uh, slice of your audience and to spell it out. So compared to, say, before academic presentations, writing conference conversations had to be very geeky. I mean, you had to be very cryptic to be taken seriously. That <laughs> I think is gone. But where is that level now? Do you feel this actively shifting? That's a good question. Um, I think with conferences, it's a little different because um, most of them, when you apply and propose your talks, do ask you what level is this at? Mm -hmm. So you can set what it is that you want. Now, I will say there's a lot of beginner content and that's okay. But I will say that there's this notion of what about the intermediate and more advanced audience members? You know, they see the same subject over and over again. They see it retold in many different ways. Well, sometimes they want the deeper stuff. Sometimes they want the more advanced stuff. And so for that, I would argue that there are conferences that actually focus on just advanced level things, or they focus on researchers actually presenting their research, uh, or there are conferences that focus on real case studies. So less theory, more doing. Um, other conferences ask, you must have a demo of some sort. It can't just be slides, uh, which that's not always bad, but they tend to focus on more beginner content or quicker presentations. So as a speaker, you can decide who you want to talk to and what level your session is at. If you have a beginner level talk and you want to kind of push yourself and reiterate on that talk and make it uh, relatable to an intermediate or a, a senior audience, do so. That's almost the best way to do it is you get all of those foundational things, but then you start to cut, you start to edit, you start to say, are there real examples that I can add now instead of a theoretical example? Is there a case study that I can bring in that supports my point? Are there data points from research papers that I can bring in that can, you know, be more, I would say, palatable or more interesting to the intermediate and senior level audience members? And then there are really interesting intersections of talks where it's kind of like a, I would say, evergreen topic. It doesn't matter what level you are, like, code reviews uh, or writing documentation, but you maybe give a more practical way on how to do something. So there could be the beginner level talk of what is a code review? Why is it important? What do you do? Or why is documentation important? How do you write documentation? And then you could have an intermediate level that says, okay, you already know about this. Here are different ways to do it. Here are mm -hmm. some patterns to do it. And then you could have maybe a senior level talk where it's just not even slides. You just go through into your ID, you show your process, you show how you publish it, you show, again, very practical ways of how you do it and how they could employ those same tactics or apply it to their own jobs right away. For me personally, those are my levels of what those talks could look like. What are you doing now at Cisco in your daily job? 
So we actually, I am now part of the community portion of the developer relations team. And that's really exciting to me because we are trying to re-engage our community. There's kind of been a small, I would say, pause of we have an established community, but we've kind of just not been there. You know, we used to have these really big local events where we would go and teach something or host a workshop in many different cities. Other times we would um, have very focused uh, collaborations with other business units to show uh, users how to use particular products. And that kind of just stopped. So we're ho wanting to kickstart that again. We're wanting to re-engage our community. And most importantly, we want to find the developers in our community or the network engineers that are possibly transitioning into automation or development. And we really want to reach out to those people. So we're pretty much, I would say, starting from scratch in terms of finding out what people want to learn from our community, what they are going to Cisco for, and then trying to accommodate them by either creating content that they're looking for or being present where they are and just kind of seeing like, you know, how are they working with Cisco products or are there things that they are missing from us that we could probably uh, support them with. So this is literally just started maybe in the last two weeks. So Hopefully the next time we'll have some more updates with that, but that is what the future holds for the next few months. How do you see this rolling out in this year when suddenly there's a traveling restriction on budgets, like no budgets for traveling, to put it bluntly? <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, we are also affected by that. So this is where we're trying to take advantage. Um, we are a global company and we have a lot of people in the developer relations community that are worldwide. So I'm sure as most teams are, we're trying to build a way to host an event either virtually or if we are able to host it locally, we find people who are already in the intended cities that we want to host these meetups or little events in and have them take over rather than just, you know, specific set of people in the developer relations team. Another way that we're focusing on that is actually creating and curating new and interesting components for the DevNet zone. So we have a company conference, their big one called Cisco Live. We host that one three times a year in different areas of the world. So travel budget is uh, approved for those and we all have to be there. So we're trying to take advantage of that and make the best out of that. So we're trying to find uh, or we're trying to build right now a very awesome experience. I don't want to share too much because it's still in the works. But if you do happen to go to that conference, uh, we're trying to find more engaging ways to interact with that particular part of the conference. Mm -hmm. So for now, that's what we're doing. And then hopefully once travel opens up again, we can actually go and do something similar to like a roadshow or something. But we want to be able to build a self-sustaining event hosting platform where anybody can take it and just, you know, go to their own local meetups and do it themselves rather than always having it go through us. I've seen uh, Cisco Live, the last one I think was in Amsterdam that I saw mm -hmm. online. And, well, as an event organizer myself, I was, uh, yeah, floored. <laughs> it was inspiring. Thank you. Yeah, that well, was amazing. That was a great team. We really, really enjoyed all of the, uh, the Stroop waffles <laughs> and the Puffetian. <laughs> What is the message that you would like to leave those who are listening with today? I would probably want to go back to the beginner's mindset because I think that applies to a lot of things that no matter what you're doing and uh, no matter how far you are in your career, there's always a point to be made about thinking through a different perspective, whether that's a beginner's mindset or someone that's not in the same industry. That kind of goes hand in hand with being empathetic with your colleagues and community and audience, but especially for those who are creating content or uh, content, including API documentation, putting yourself in those people's footsteps and seeing it through their eyes, I think overall makes anything that we produce much, much better and much more valuable. So I'll, I'll probably leave with that. Start with the beginner's mindset and never forget it. Thank you, Adrian. And I'm looking forward to the following chapters of your book and your <laughs> next book and the one after that. Oh, geez. Yeah, I'll take a break first. <laughs> Let's finish this one first. Thank you very much for being the guest here and see you at the next conference. Yes, likewise. Thanks, Laura. 
Thank you for listening to the API The Docs podcast. We thank our colleagues at Pronovis Developer Portals for letting us work on this, and the entire API community for all of the mutual support and sharing of experiences that you give each other. Do you have a topic or guest that you would like us to spotlight? Drop a note at podcast at pronovix.com. If you go to the website, api.docs.org, you can find the recaps and recordings of past API.docs conferences, as well as the upcoming program. Until next time, be well. <laughs>